Well, good morning, everyone. Thursday morning. Darren Saul here, your host of Playing With Perspective, the suspended animation podcast. I hope everybody's doing fantastically well. And I have a very, very special guest today and a very, very special show. We have Michael Bartura joining us all the way from Melbourne. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Very excited to be on board. I am loving your background and your brain behind you. That's fantastic. <laughs> I wish it was my brain. Mine is much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And as you can probably guess, we're going to be chatting all about how to cultivate happiness through self-awareness. Now, for everybody out there that doesn't know Michael, for over three decades, Michael has been involved in lifestyle education, health and wellness promotion, training and organizational development. He has worked around the world as a therapist, a not-for-profit senior manager, a trainer, and an entrepreneur. In Australia, he runs his own practice called Happy Habits Coaching and works with individuals, organizations, and startups, delivering high-quality training and coaching with a particular focus on mindfulness-based EQ directed approach to workplace wellness and work life balance. He is a member of the core faculty of the School of Life in Melbourne, where he teaches seminars and workshops like Improve Your Emotional Intelligence, How to Develop Self Knowledge, and How to Enjoy Life. He is an associate of the Asian Leadership Institute, which runs retreats and online trainings for executives and teams to build transformational leadership acumen. So welcome, Michael Bartura. Thank you. Thank you. Very glad to be I'm, here. I'm honored in the presence of such a scholar, such an achieved um, professional and a scholar with all these accolades. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that one does not plan life in a sense. Like, yes, we do have ideas about how we want it, but it usually unfolds in a very different way. So. The reason why there is so much there is because many times life just fell apart. So the minute I thought I've got it and this is what I'm going to do, or this yep. is how I'm going to be in the world, yep. um, life have a different idea and I had to move on to the next chapter and the next chapter. So I yep. think some of those achievements, if you ask me at the time, um, I, I wasn't sort of sure they were achievement. They were more like wrecks on the side of the, <laughs> of the, of the road. But what it did teach me is that I had some, um, I had the fortune to engage with a lot of people in a lot of setups and a lot of situations. And I guess there's some experience and hopefully some wisdom that came out of that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I always say we're, we're the sum of, you know, the sum of all our parts. So in a way that kind of makes up who you are and mm. your journey brings you to where you are now with all that amazing knowledge and wisdom that you've gathered over the years to help you mm. do what you do. So it's kind of like an interesting, you know, summary of everything you've done. Yeah. But um, obviously today we're going to be chatting all about, you know, this very um, important topic and very spoken about topic, which is mindfulness, self-awareness, self-knowledge, EQ. Um, you know, everybody's talking about this more and more these days. And um, I think it's just because, you know, we're realizing as a society and as a, as a community that we really have to start taking time to develop that side of us because maybe it's been neglected over the years, um, mm. been focusing on other things. And we're realizing how important that is, particularly in challenges or challenging times like we're in right now. Mm. Um, so let's dive in because we've got lots of stuff to tackle. I mean, obviously, you know, what is the point of developing self-awareness and self-knowledge? And I'm going to throw this like devil's advocate question at you here because, you know, we've been, we've been living successfully without it for so many years. Mm. Why should we start getting into it now? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to ask yourself just because something is popular or something, you know, is talked about as the best new thing. Yeah. Does it work for me? Should I really, um, you know, should I really engage with it just because other people do? Yeah. But that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. And, and you use the word successfully, you know, can we live successfully without it? Well, I guess the question is, what is your definition of success? Because yeah. in some way, yes, we have lived successfully without it in the sense that we build this incredible modern world. But it's a sad world, you know, it's a troubled world. It's a world that doesn't know how to be at peace with itself. We don't know how to be at peace with each other. Very few of us are at peace with ourselves. Yep. 
And so the definition of success in this case has gone very much towards the success along the line of, you know, mater materially successful or, Absolutely. you know, having status or being famous or being powerful and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that is success uh, in, in some realm without a doubt. And some people do it better than others. But I think um, what we're looking for is a definition of success where you get up in the morning and you have a great day and then you yeah. get up the next day and you have another great day. And now yeah. can you get to that? And it doesn't mean that all the time, every day is just this, you know, happy, lovey, dovey situation, but that you know how to ride life. You know how to roll with the punches when stuff happens, like for example, a big stuff like COVID-19 crisis or something in personally in your life when you have a, a small crisis or even just a bad day, yeah. how do you show up in that day and, and, and respond to it in a way that doesn't feel like you you know, life is terrible or life is misery or life is suffering, which is tend to be the situation that a lot of us goes through. So I think in that sense, what self-awareness does is a little bit like the analogy of driving a car where you've driven your car with say second and third gear most of your life. Yep. And you don't even know that there is a fourth and maybe even a fifth gear that you, you're able to use uh, because you're not aware of certain mechanisms of the way the mind works and what you can do with that, that allow you to be more content, more resilient, more able to, um, cultivate relationship in a way that works for you and for other people. Yep. And that's what self-awareness does. In other words, it gives you certain insights and practices uh, that, that allow you to be more resourceful um, and learn how to deal with the general vagaries of life. You know, life is unpredictable and it has complex relationship. And, and if you notice, we have this bizarre inner voice in our head that seems yep. to be negative a lot of the time. Yep. And I think what self-awareness does is that it gives you the, the know-how to, to work better with those with that terrain and 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 deal better with the with the complexities of of life right. and, I, and I love that because I mean even in the last you know three four months i 've kind of you know slightly pivoted a little bit and, and trying to develop new things and new offerings and solutions and whatnot and i'm i 'm thinking a lot about this in particular, and it 's this that we want to have a life where we are in control of it rather mm. than it controls us. <laughs> You know, you look around and so many people are scrambling and, you know, me as well sometimes. And we're trying to just get stuff done. And, you know, we're always behind the eight ball. We don't have any time. I'm saying, is this how it's meant to be? No way. You know, we have to start, we have to get on the front foot and we have to take mm. control of life mm. and, le and, le and live the way we want to live. And as you said, I love the way you said, you know, we want to be able to get up in the morning and be happy to get up in the morning and go to work and be excited mm. about what we're doing mm. most of the time. So, you know, it's a really big thing for me is to really, you know, find the balance where and find the peace and awareness and the definition of success for me. Mm. Is I'm in control of my life rather than I'm just a slave to it. Right. Yeah. And it's very interesting. You bring up the notion of control because Ultimately, we don't have control. And, and, yeah, and um, you know, if we'll talk a little bit about the crisis, I, I think we mentioned we might sort of explore that a little bit later, you know, COVID-19 and whatnot. Yeah. Um, um, what, 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 what we'll see is that one of, the, one of the biggest impressions that we are experiencing individually and collectively is this, uh, the, you know, it, it's ripped apart the illusion of control because, yeah. you know, three... Um, what's today's is sort of like 20 something of June. So people don't realize it, but the first person to die of this crisis is less than five months ago, wow. right? In China. So, so in, in, a, in a very short few months, life as we know it has been ripped apart. Yep. And, um, and so this illusion of control is something that we go for because there is a evolutional mechanism that, uh, that helps us to survive by trying to create our environment to suit our needs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yet, uh, if you reflect on it, so if you, you know, sort of use self-awareness to reflect, well, you realize that you don't actually have control over circumstances. Life just happens. Definitely. Yep. And, uh, and what we continuously are trying to do is we try to manipulate how life happens. So we have the illusion of control. Yep. And we can do that to a degree, especially in developed world. Uh, you know, sort of life works, right? Like we, we can expect stuff and stuff is there because, you know, we know that it was there yesterday and it seems to be there today, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and yet, ultimately, you have no control. You have no idea whatsoever what's going to happen once you open the door and walk out of your house, yeah. right? Sure. Um, and, and I think uh, all of us have had experiences in life that suddenly, you know, some, some sickness, an accident, a yeah. death of a relative and, 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 and whatnot, was suddenly this, this illusion that, you know, life works according to the way I think it is just get sort of preempted by, by, you know, just being hit sideways by the reality of, no, life happens when it happens as it does. Exactly. But we do have control about some aspects. And I think when you talk about learning how to control life and how to live a life worth living, like, um, um, like uh, we say times, sometimes philosophically, um, the idea is that we can control our relationship with what's going on. Exactly. Right? We might not be able to control the circumstances, but we're certainly able to control, you know, what kind of meaning we give it. Yep. Uh, and what is our focus in what's going on and yep. what kind of actions we're going to take in response. And okay. so we want to focus on cultivating the ability to notice where we argue with reality yep. rather than just seeing that it is what it is yep. and then learning how to respond more skillfully with that reality in the way that we think about it and in the way we take action and that's the that's the action of taking control absolutely i love that so it's really about taking control of what happens in life mm. life does does its thing life's on its own autopilot but you can choose how you react to it and yes. that's where the control comes in. Yeah, you can that's feel right. like you yeah. must have some say in what you're doing every day. Yeah. And in, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frankel, uh, Victor Frankel, who was a, a psychologist, a Jewish psychologist in, in Europe in, in the early part of the last century and, and had, you know, went to, I think, two, maybe even three different concentration camps through the, through the Holocaust. Um, and used his learning to observe what what's going on in in, in you know for people in such dire circumstances, yeah. um, and in his book uh, Life Search for, oh, in Hebrew it's Life Search for uh, Meaning I think it's if I translate it's either Life Search for a Reason or Life Search for a Meaning I'm not sure how it's called in English because nice. I read it in Hebrew but yeah. but I think it's Life Search for a Meaning anyway in this classic book he talks about what he calls the last of the human freedoms, right? It's like when you have no control about whatsoever and you cannot take more extreme situation than a concentration camp, um, you still have control about how you're going to react to that, yep. right? You're still yeah. going to, like ultimately your relationship with life is not through what's going on outside, it's through the way you think about it. Absolutely. And, and no one can take away the power of, how you want to think about it in that sense. So think, for example, Bar uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nelson Mandela. Yep. Uh, walking out of the jail after 27 years and making a decision that he can be angry and hate his guards and carry that animosity with him, or he can just let it go and forgive and you know walk away a free man. Yeah. Um, that's a choice that he made, right? And and you know most of us will never get tested, and hopefully and thankfully, in these sort of extreme circumstances. But the same principle apply. You know, when shit happens, you can choose to go, "Oh my God, shit happens, and I'm lost control, and I'm going to try and manipulate it to do this, or that, or the other." Or you can just say, "Shit happens, and I can just take it as an opportunity rather than as a as a you know a, a, a stalling of my own." plan so to speak yeah absolutely and and that's really interesting point i mean if we're talking about you know control in that respect if we now pivot slightly and talk about our childhood and how does our childhood affect our personality and how we deal things because we weren't in control we didn't have the capacity mm. to, uh, to develop and we didn't have self-awareness um you know as kids as much as we do as we grow Right. So that's kind of a bit of a, um, a slight, um, what's the word? It's a slight antagonistic effect that yeah. we're, we're fighting against our childhood and our, our nature versus nurture in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So how does no, our childhood correct. affect our personality and, you know, when we do therapy and whatnot, how, what, what's the best way to go about that? Right. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point. So there's a guy called Michael Neal, who, um, who's an interesting coach who worked with a lot of, um, um, you know, a lot of principles that I, I, I find very useful in this sort of domain. 
And, and one of the things that he points out is that he realized that, that babies don't need psychology, yeah. right? They don't need, they don't need treatments. In, in other words, you know, when we come to the word relatively, right? I mean, it depends where you're born and what culture and whatnot. But generally, when we're born, we kind of born with an operating system that is meant to function within a very nurturing environment. Because you think about our evolution, and this is part of the problem, why we're so confused in this modern world and why so many of us are miserable, right. is that we, are, we have evolved to operate in a particular environment. And that particular environment um, at the time of our evolution was very much a nurturing tribal kind of environment where babies were born into this big, tribal situation there were lots of kids around there were lots of people to take care of a crying baby not like today you know when the parents are frazzled there's no one there to kind of take over it it, it doesn't have that and so and so there was a lot of nurturing um on the on in the first few immediate years of babies growing up where there was lots of company lots of community lots of connection and safety to to the degree that was possible you know and i i don't want to kind of sound like um I'm, I'm painting this sort of idyllic you know picture of life during the hunters and gatherers time because it wasn't often you know like um, I think that the, the accepted uh, sentence was life was short, brutish, and nasty. But, <laughs> but, but, and you know, most people die by the age of 40 or 50, right? Maximum. But, but, but the point is that, but as, as the operating system here was evolving, as this, you know, big brain was evolving during that first few years, relatively, it was quite safe and it was quite nurtured and loved. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so uh, when a child is born, a child does not have a personality as such in the sense that they don't know how to react to the outside world from within particular patterns of behavior. They just learning continuously all the time. They're learning to walk, they're learning to speak, they're learning to relate. But most of it comes out of a level of innocence and an openness that is natural for who we are and only gets damaged when it doesn't get answered or doesn't get responded to appropriately. So if, you know, the child learns that it's his, he or she are happy yeah. and then they're not happy because they're hungry or because they cold. And so they don't have a way to communicate it. They cry. And usually the mother or another adult in the tribe would come and will do something about it. And so over time, there's this development of, of trying to insist on what we want, right? by the best means that we can have to the circumstances that we grow up, right? And this is where you start to see personalities evolving according to the contours or the territory in which they grew up. Or if you want to use the garden analogy, it depends where the child was planted, <laughs> what kind of condition they have. Did they have enough water? Did they have enough sunshine? That sort of stuff. So okay. most Parents, I think, mean quite well, but because we all short-sighted in terms of how to work with our emotions and our inner conversation, lack of self-awareness, you could say, um, we usually tend to transfer our own personality difficulties to our own, you know, to our children and so on and so forth. And so as the child grows, the child gets into a habit of, you know, okay, what worked for me in terms of trying to get what I want? And you can look at it as a sort of an example of where... Um, you know, what did the child had to do to get attention, right? What did the child had to do to get noticed? Yeah. And some children had to be smart because that got them the love that they felt like. Some children had to yell and be really angry. Yeah. Some children had to, you know, sort of be quiet and be a good girl or a good boy. And that becomes a personality. In other words, the, the patterns that we developed, learning how to try and get what we want, are kind of the patterns that we keep doing into our adults, except they become unconscious. So they're, they're you know, kind of by like the time you're forming years, seven, are they? They're like forming years. Yes, that's right. So by the time you're six or seven, you, most of your personality is there, and most of it about I think the estimates are about ninety to ninety-five percent of your thinking is unconscious or subconscious, wow. and so all of it is just going on, right? It's like the the engine under the hood. You don't see the engine when you drive, but it, it's there all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So so that's what's going on, and this is why it's really quite important to try and start to unpack what you are doing unconsciously through self-awareness. And so then, how is how easy is it? to start updating that operating system if, if we were so well formed by at a young age? <laughs> um, I don't think it's, it's easy. I don't, I don't think so. You know, like it's very hard to stop 
we, we so wired already because this yeah. is all our brains right like mm -hmm. like when 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 the child's brain is evolving it, 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 it wires itself in this incredible speed. I mean, we're talking trillions of cells that are just kind of moving and wiring and connecting. And, and in fact, when, when we're born, our brain has a lot more, you know, sort of neural sort of uh, potential than what we actually use. And one of the reasons why uh, during teen, teen, teenage years, you get this sort of craziness from teenagers because that that po that point in time is when the brain culls a lot of those unused um, wiring, right? Mm -hmm. So the potential, it's a bit like a computer that comes with this incredible huge hard drive and very large RAM. And then in response to what you actually sort of put on it, the rest of it just get culled, right? Um, and so, it, once it's get wired in a particular way, it's actually quite hard to change. And, and you really need to be diligent in learning how to catch yourself in old patterns yeah. and then making sure that you, you're not responding in, this, in the same way uh, and you start to respond in a different way until you rewired the habits uh, and created a new habit in your brain. And this is sometimes, for example, this is the, probably the most common example that people can relate to. You make a decision about your lifestyle. You make a decision about the way you eat. Yep. You think, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to stop eating, you know, whatever, chocolates or, yep. you know. Uh, <laughs> Cakes or whatever. You know, yeah. and, then, and then something happened and you watch yourself taking that piece of cake or you watch yourself <laughs> taking that piece of you can see yourself doing it and you kind of know that that's not what you want to do but you do it anyway well you do it anyway yep. right and so a lot of the art for us in terms of trying to change is to become aware of what are those hidden patterns what is a submerged part of our consciousness that is activating while we do that and how to rewire ourselves consciously to activate it in a different way yeah Seems like a lot of work. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, I, I've, I've discovered this when I, because I worked as, as a physical therapist for about 12 years in, in an earlier life, life cycle, let's call it. And one of the things that, that was really kind of mind boggling for me is that after a while I realized that a lot of people want to feel better but very few people actually want to change. You know, it's like, you know it's like we got this innate drive to kind of, you know, like we want to feel better about ourselves, about what we do or whatever. But do we actually want to pay the price that it takes to cultivate changes in our behavior? No, because it's hard work, right? Yeah, or, yeah. or in other words, it's not necessarily hard as much as it requires this a, a continuous application, diligence in application that is bothersome, you know, and it's just a lot easier to sort of turn on the telly and take another chocolate from the, from the fridge. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, it really all boils down to self-awareness, doesn't it? That's the beginning of your journey yes. with change because you have to understand I, I, yourself. I think, I think you're right. I think it's a key ingredient, right? It's, 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 it's almost like, um, so sometimes I use this language, you know, you want to get to the point where you remember to remember. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know what to do, but it's almost like because you're so we we so unconscious with how we we show up in most of our interactions with ourselves and with others, that we just sort of we just follow this. It's like a, we we learn how to fly on an autopilot, and unless we continuously switch off the autopilot, we'll fly at the same height, at the same speed, at the same directions that we were programmed to do it. And so, uh, self awareness, what it allows you, it allows you to sort of kind of start to switch off the autopilot and really be present with the experience because what you find the, the other side of it is that most of the time we don't actually want to be present with what's going on and 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 screens mobile phone has now turned this into have kind of dialed up the level of insanity yep. for us um of not being present with our experience to this completely wow. new i mean we are in an unknown territory yes. we we are using um a sort of a psychological experience with 7 billion people, or maybe there's 1 billion that still people who still don't have a mobile, yeah. but most of us do, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and having this kind of continuous thing that takes us away from being present, uh, I, I don't know what we'll find out, but we will. It's a, it's a continuous um, distraction that it is, is, it that is. We, are, and, we can use yeah. anytime we want. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And we want to be present with our experience because that's the only place where we can actually affect change. You know, we need to be aware of it yeah actually here's a good question i mean listening to you 
I mean, it sounds, you know, really it seems like it makes perfect sense what you're saying. And if we have to continue to apply and execute self-awareness to understand how to change and to change our behavior, do you ever get to a point where you actually do, be, you actually do reprogram or do you always have to be mindful and aware of making sure you don't fall back into the old patterns? Is there a point when you actually have succeeded in changing that operating system and then you don't have to worry as much about self-awareness or does that not happen? No, you, you can actually change, you know, like if you're, if your brain is now rewired to interact differently with a situation that you always were unconsciously reactive to once you've, once you've done it, you know, like once you've done it a few times, the brain starts to arrange it the way that the neural pathways react to that situation in a different way. And if you do it well enough, it's just rewired for a new behavior. And you can look at the data. If you go online, usually the number that is quoted is 21 days, right? Yeah. And I think, I think that's a bit of a mistake from what I could figure out because I tried to understand where does that come from, is that there was a particular study on a fairly small sample that suggested that number, and that's the most quoted study, and therefore that becomes the golden number. But, uh, but the actual statistics, when you take a lot of more research into it, is that it, it takes on average about 66 days or something like that. So anything between 20 days to 180 days, and if you look at, you know, sort of like just the data in, in, in big samples, um, it's around two to three months, right? So the question is, can you set yourself up to behave differently at a particular situation where you've always done the same? You've always opened the, you know, like you came home, you had your a good day at work, you had a bad day at work, but you got into the habit of coming on, kicking, coming home, kicking your heels off, as they yeah, say, yeah. And, you know, going to the fridge, taking a beer, opening it up and turning on the news. And that's what you do. And it's your way to kind of relax in a sense, yeah. right? But then there gets a point where you realize, you know what? A, I'm not sure that watching the news helped me to relax. And, 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 and B, I'm not sure that drinking a beer every night is something that I want to do, right? So I want to change those behaviors. So now you got to go against the way that your brain is just know, knows how to defrag at the end of the day. Yep. And you got to consciously do it enough times, you know, and if I wanted to flip it to, you know, like, are you going to go into, okay, well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to make myself a green smoothie and sit on the cushion and meditate. Okay, you know, that's kind of like a farce in a sense or a caricature of the hippie way to go about it. But what I'm trying to say is you try to establish maybe a slightly more help. Maybe I'm going to spend 20 minutes with the kids when I come home. Maybe you're going to go for a walk different. around the block or a little run. Or something. Yeah, that's right. So, so how do you turn that into a habit? But once you've done it for two or three months, what you'll find is that that will be the, your place, you know, instead of opening the fridge, taking the beer, you'll open the door and hug your kid because now you've made that the pattern. So definitely can change, definitely can change a lot, but you have to really want to do it and you have to find your why. And then you have to kind of use the science of habit changing to really apply it and make it work. Perfect. That makes sense. And so then what are the keys to self-awareness? Are there any particular things that we really need to embrace to really um, understand self-awareness? Um, yeah, I think there's this few kind of, um, there's, there's a couple of concepts and a practice that you need to sort of work with. So the first concept is, is you, you, you see, we tend to assume continuity of ourself, yeah. right? So I say, who's Darren? You know, if I tell, you know, hey, Darren, how are you doing? I met you in a party and we're talking and I say, so, you know, who are you kind of thing, right? Yeah. And so you'll probably tell me a little bit about, you know, what you do and maybe about your family, you know, family situation and maybe your aspirations. Uh, you might share, you know, what you like in sport. In other words, you'll tell me the story of your life, yeah. right? And what happens to us is that because we live that story from within a sense of presence that we're actually not aware of, but is there all the time. In other words, your sense of self, your sense of I, you yes. wake up in the morning and you feel this I, right? And yes. it's, it's a felt experience, right? So because we live our life from within that felt of sense of I, we tend to assume that everything in our story, right, is actually a continuum that has some sort of an external validation 
uh, you know, through being being real. It it has a you know it has an entity that is there. That I myself, that yeah. separate entity to the world, yeah. Yeah. right, is who I am. Gotcha. Right, and and because it's a felt experience, because we live that, we tend to just assume that that's the case. Right. And one of the things that presence starts to bring up, the experience of being present, is the insight that everything we assume is that continued only exists in our head. In other words, if you tune into your experiences as Darren, what you realize is that that story that you tell yourself about who you are right now in the present moment when you and I are talking about does not exist other than a thought in your head. True. Yeah. You have the felt experience, but that felt experience doesn't have a description. It just feels like I am sitting or yeah. I am hungry or I'm talking to Michael. Yeah. But the story of who is talking to Michael, that's a thought in your head. So the first concept you kind of want to develop and presence, mindfulness, self-reflection, self-awareness, meditation, all those practices help to do it, is learning how to come back to that presence and, and, and kind of develop a little bit of space from the story. Because that space, what it allows you to do, it allows you to start making choices, right? In terms of how you're going to react to things. Because instead of just, well, you know, um, I don't like conservatives, right? So every time I meet a conservative, I don't like them because they're conservative. That's yeah. my story, right? It's instead automatic, of uh, automatic you someone and you open to like that person regardless of their political opinion. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that is important, that understanding that concept that I'm not my personality, I'm not the story I tell myself about myself in my mm -hmm. head is That's really important. And how do I become more present with what's real? I love it. Yeah. And the second one that, that's really quite useful is this idea that once you develop this perception, what you see is that everything, I mentioned this before, everything that you relate to in your life is a relationship that you have through the way you think about it. Right which gives you a lot of power because that means that you can change the way you think about things if it doesn't serve you. In other words, if the thinking that you have about something is not resourceful to bring you to a place where you're happy with it, where you're comfortable with it, where you want to relate to it and move it and change it and engage with it rather than hate it and react it and bash it and kick it and nullify it, um, you can start to sort of dance with what life comes, sends at you and instead of kind of like reject it or force it, you can sort of say, okay, now what? How can I dance with what's going on? It's kind of, a, it's a bit like justification, isn't it? In a way. Yeah, what well, was, well, sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Say some more. It's almost a bit like self-justification in a way. Mm. You know, certain things happen and you build a story around them that fits with you. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, we have this mechanism, sometimes we call it the ego, but basically there is this, the sense of the, the entity self, the sense of self, as an entity, what it does is, and it's a primarily, again, a survival mechanism, what it does is most of the time it tries to avoid domination by others and yeah. dominate the situation, gotcha. right? To get that control that you mentioned before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we continuously operate from that, from that entity, and, and you're very right, we justify to ourselves whatever we do, we do because it feels like that will deliver that sense of control, right? And, and a really good example is we love to get offended, right? <laughs> right? And then we love to justify to ourselves yeah. why it's fair enough that we got offended. So yeah. if you think, if you tune into, for example, say you had an argument with someone at work, yeah. Yeah. what do we do with it in our hand? We spend the next three days arguing the same arguments with kind of minor variations yeah. 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 and we look for the places where it's kind of fair enough that I'm pissed off because yeah, da, 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 it's da, not da, my da. fault. They that's shouldn't fine. have said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. That's a kind of a different way to define insanity. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Okay, awesome. Um, and so is there anything else that we should learn? Right. So, so, so I said two concepts. So the concept of just this understanding of what is self yep. versus kind of this, this personality self that we assume yep. and then working with that perception, to create some space between us and what's going on mm -hmm. and say, okay, how can I be present with that? How can I perceive what's going on? Not from the place of my story, but from the place of what's real, what is actually happening and how do I skillfully kind of deal with it? 
right? Yeah. And that's where we're this, this understanding that we can change the way we think about things, not the things themselves. No. Um, and then the last thing is that I said it's the practice. You really have to create triggers and reminders in your life to do that well enough and often enough so it starts to become your baseline rather than this occasional thing that we might do when we stand in front of the beach and we suddenly have a moment of, you know, like a divine moment of presence yeah. or, yeah. or we listen to a song and suddenly, you know, sometimes we get transported by artistic experience. That's what yeah. art does. Yeah. Um, and so occasionally we touch it through that. But how do I create it as a baseline where I have enough of it throughout the day for it to start curate my experience from a more present place, more aware place? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Wow, I mean, that's uh, heavy stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about um, happiness. Mm. Why are some people so happy and some people aren't? <laughs> um. Well, one has to wonder about happiness, you know, I, there's probably a bit of a fallacy because, you know, this idea of this individualistic happiness that we, we strive so strongly to get to yeah. uh, is, a, is a cultural imprint. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily it's bad. I'm just saying that it's not, it's not in tune to the way that we wired to start with. And it's very hard to get under the definitions of happiness as we've defined them in our society, right? In other words, it's not that happiness is not available. It's just not available in the way that we look for it. Yeah. And we, always think, that, we always think that we have to be happy 24-7, but life does, doesn't work that way. Well, it's a bit like the weather, you know, it's like, it's not sunny all the time. Sometimes yeah, exactly. it's just wet, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the problem is that we, we assume that we can only be happy when we sunny yeah. instead of learning to kind of be content with the fact that sometimes it's wet. Yeah. And appreciate, um, appreciate those times. Appreciate. They provide that. a perspective. And, and, and learning how to, you know, learning how to surf those emotions when they arise. Mm -hmm. And, and, and instead of being stuck in them, because the other thing is that we do, we have this very, this is a particular human practice, which is bizarre and doesn't serve us well, where we kind of double up on our emotions. In other words, um, I get angry and then I get angry with myself about being angry. Oh, God. Right? Or I get, I get, I, I feel sad about something and then I feel sad because I'm feeling sad, right? It's oh, this sort God. of double whammy yeah, yeah. that we do. And what you find is that we go into our heads. In other words, in, in, instead of just experiencing the, the emotion as a sort of a wedding pattern that sort of comes and goes and it does whatever it does to kind of bring us back into equilibrium, we, we tend to go into our head about, about it and then we try to you know, sort of analyze it. Should I be feeling this? I shouldn't be feeling this. I should be feeling that. Or I'm getting annoyed that I felt that. Or I felt this because I felt that. And, and we, we just analyze get analyze and we dwell and we latch and, onto things from and, days on end. Yeah, there's some really interesting work. Um, I think the well, what's her name? Um, there's a woman called uh, Jill Bolter Tyler. Fascinating. She's got a, a TED talk. I highly recommend it. Who is a neuroscientist who had a stroke, and she kind of described her whole experience through going through that, while looking at it being the scientist. It's amazing. But um, she points out that there is a chemical process that has to do with emotions that kind of lasts about a minute or two. I think she calls it the 90 seconds rule. In other words, when an emotion comes up, instead of just doing anything with it, if you just allow yourself to feel it for yeah. like a minute it will start to subside anyway because it just does this, this chemical soup that just flows inside your brain and inside your body and does its thing. Yeah. And then it comes come back into balance. That's what the body's supposed to do. Yeah. And, and instead of sort of worrying about it too much or thinking as you know about it, you just allow that, then you'll find yourself 90 seconds later in a much better place to actually deal with the situation. Gotcha. Right? And, and so if you're not happy, just be not happy for a little yeah, bit then yeah. see what happens so that's acceptance. the first thing acceptance about. is a big thing yeah just yeah. A, you know um you, you can look at it this way you can you know like if you say yes to something that's when you kind of can go beyond it if yeah. if you continuously fight it and, and and engage with it then you still it's still there you know yeah, like you yeah. you're still wrestling with a demon that you could have left long time ago yeah absolutely and so i think i think happiness is available for us when we start to understand what's real which is the present 
moment experience yeah. and what is just in our head. And you find, you know, like pain is there, but suffering is optional. Right. A lot <laughs> of the times that we, we, we miserable, we miserable because what we do in the conversation in our head about what's going on, not about what actually goes on. Right. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. And I think another part of it is we have to understand that there is a certain somatic, um, terrain that we evolve through and and that terrain has to play itself out so we have this we have this uh, a triad system in our brain it's called the tree and brain which are different levels of evolutions you know the reptile brain is the original kind of brain and then we so we got a little bit more evolved and the limbic system starts to sort of you know develop and became a lot more you know sort of involved with the way we interact and then finally we got those higher cortex you know the neocortex and all that sort of stuff and and one way to look about it it is you know you can look at it as you know we have a lizard brain and we have a, a, a mouse brain, you know, like the mammalian, the paleomammalian brain, as they call it. And then it's the higher function is, is sort of like the monkey brain, the, the, you know, the, the, the more evolved part of who we are. Okay. And you got to do stuff with those for, to be happy. In other words, if you don't pet the lizard yeah. and the lizard feels unsafe, it doesn't matter what's going on in terms of your internal conversation. You won't be able to feel relaxed. You won't be able to just chill. You won't be able to expand yourself because your lizard feels under threat. Gotcha. So you gotta pet the lizard, um, and then you gotta kind of feed the monkey. You gotta make sure that the, you know, like the emotions are you know, satisfied, like you got some connections, you got, some, you, you got a sense of like belonging, that sort of stuff. And finally, you wanna hug the monkey. You wanna kind of, you know, you wanna bring in that, that um, gotcha. um, you, you know, in terms of, in terms of uh, if you look at the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, the, those upper, the upper two realms, the self-actualization or whatever. If you can tick those boxes, then you'll find that you naturally will be content. But you can't do that as a way of forceful external process. Oh, I'm going to be happy because, you know, like I have everything I need. Because yep. it doesn't work. I mean, see how many rich people are out there who are quite miserable, right? So you got to find a way to work with your psychology and learn to put yourself in a place where you feel safe and warm and content with what's around you. And from that work, from that place you work. Yeah. And that's actually really interesting because where, as you mentioned, if you just sit and accept whatever's happening for 60 to 90 seconds, that placates the lizard brain and the lower evolved parts of your brain. And then they're happy. Then you can, start moving to the higher place and actually making changes most of the time so so specifically with the so for example the, the lizard brain is the one that's that's um in charge of your safety right mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what you think if the if if something triggers in you a sense of insecurity you're you're in fear fight flight mode you can't you know, you can't go into the other sympathy, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system is the relax and digest. You can't go into that. Yeah. If your sympathetic nervous system is switched on and it's switched on like that for a very um, mi minor trigger, yeah. you walk into, for example, if you walk into a room that you've never been in before, yeah. your lizard brain is thinking, where are the tigers? Where are the lions? You know, like, you know, this is not conscious, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you meant to do that. It makes a lot of sense because it keeps you, you safe. If you walk down to a new water hole, you've never walked down to that water hole. You want to make sure that you are kind of like in control of what's going on and you kind of know where you are and you look and you wait because the, you know, like you don't know where the, where the lions are, right? Or the hyenas or the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the crocodiles, right? <laughs> so, so, so our brain is very much switched on for that. And in fact, one of the fascinating things that is coming now, you know, we're learning more about the brain now in the last, I think that what I've read is something like we've learned more about the brain in the last two or three years than we learned in 150 years before. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Fascinating stuff. And because they can MRI our brains now, they can see what lights up and what's, you know, switches on in different situations. And one of the things they realize is we have this thing called the negative bias, which is a survival bias that meant to ensure that we will not take a chance on something that might be negative. In other words, we wired to look for what's going to go wrong. We right. wired to look for the tigers. Right. In fact, there's some fascinating research that was done by a mathematician where they, they crunched this model of what is the benefit for the human brain to understand reality versus to ensure survival. Right. 
And having done hundreds and hundreds of thousands of simulation along that algorithm, they find out there's absolutely no reason for the brain to understand reality, <laughs> right? It's like 0.0% of the time, the brain choose to understand reality. The brain will choose to understand survival. And this is why you have a situation where you might go out with a friend and you'll have a very different experience because you are working through your survival mechanism and he or she are working through their survival mechanism. And, you know, depends which one of you are more relaxed, probably going to have a better time, right? So you walk into a room and your brain is looking for the tigers or the lions, right? So on that lizard brain, it's not just a 90 seconds. This is a long way of answering your question. Yep. We have to understand how the, the psychology and the, the, neuro, the neurobiology of it works and give it, you know, pet the lizard in the sense of, okay, if you walk to a new space, just give yourself a few minutes to kind of look around and so express, in other words, express that part of the brain. Yes. Once that's happy, you can move on to the other side. That's right. Turn the lizard on its back and pet its stomach. <laughs> and I love it. Wow. <laughs> okay, I'm happy now. <laughs> now we can move to the mouse and then we can move to the monkey. That's right. I yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> so Michael, I love and my audience loves stories and case studies. Okay. I mean, I would love to hear a, a, an example of something from your practice, from your history, about where, where you might have really taken somebody and move them through understanding of self-awareness and executing self-awareness and really made life-changing um, things happen. So I okay. if you've got any stories that you can share. I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, to be, to be fair to, to my, um, my coaches, so to speak, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about my story in a sense. Yeah, I think yeah. that's kind of more, uh, um, you know, sort of the more transparent thing to do. So I, I'll tell you a story that I think will, will highlight a lot of what we're working. So if you, if you were with me, I'm going back a long time. Uh, if you were with me around the beginning of the 80s, so, so right. almost 40, yeah, for just, just under 40 years, yeah. I was a young soldier. Yeah. Um, and I was trained to do, you know, my job as a soldier, and I was trained very well, right? And, and, and if you were at that particular day with me, what you would have been doing is you were sitting with me in, in a small, it's kind of like a tank, yeah. but it doesn't have a cannon. It's called, I think in English, it's called armored personal carrier it's okay imagine like a tank without a con it's a big machine and you know it's, it's it's got i don't know it's like 10 tons or something like that and i was driving one of those in the streets of beirut from all places wow and uh and so i'm driving in this fairly narrow street and i you know we were going to war we needed to go from a place to place and there was you know sort of rockets going on and it was it was like it was not a happy place in a yeah. sense and as I'm driving, because this thing is quite wide, and this and, and Beirut, by the way, is a beautiful, was a beautiful city. I'm hoping that it's beautiful again. Um, but it, imagine a little bit like a St. Kilda or maybe even like a coal field street, you know, like, like a sort of trees and, yep. and cars parking on both sides. One of those, like a suburb yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And I'm realizing as I'm driving that because of the weeds of this machine, I'm clipping the mirrors of the cars on both sides, right? Yeah. yeah. And I grew up in a in a fairly, you know, gentle, respectful kind of household. You know, my my parents always told me to respect other people, respect other people's, you know, sort of belongings. This idea of creating damage was very difficult for me. So I started to try and drive. <laughs> in a way that I could sort of <laughs> to navigate, you know, the mirrors and, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, this, this is a big machine. And when you sort of move the levers, it doesn't kind of, it's not like a little gentle. So it just, you know, it sort of moves from side to side. So of course it just becomes very complex. And, and, you know, a couple of times, instead of avoiding clipping a mirror, I actually smash the door and stuff like that. So I'm doing this for about a minute. And my officer who's sitting above me, kicks me in the back and say, you know, some very unhappy superlative <laughs> about, you know, my driving and like, what are you doing? Just go with it. We need to get to. And something happened at that moment, which was very bizarre because I suddenly saw the clash of my identities, right? So I have this identity where I'm a soldier and I do what I'm told and I have a war to fight. And then I have my identity that was like, you know, the good human being that 
that respects other people's property. And I was trying to kind of do both. Yeah. And it, it didn't sit. Yep. And I, I don't know, you know, when I'm telling it now, I'm not sure how much of it was conscious at that point. But what it did trigger is this kind of insight into how there is something there that must be prior to identity, right? There must be something that doesn't belong here and that, because they're only real in a particular situation, right? Like, like they're, only, they're only relevant to behavior in a particular setup, but suddenly I was in a setup where it wasn't relevant. And when I was trying to behave in the old way, in the new setup, it didn't work. It wasn't right. the right thing to do. Probably was smart of the officers to get me going instead of driving, inching along and wrecking cars <laughs> along the way, right? <laughs> and so by way of saying that, I think what self-awareness does is it, that over time it allows you to start to rest at that sense of self without the story. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, you're not as bound by the limitation of what you think about yourself and even more important, uh, not so much conceptually or philosophically, but just to how you show up and how you enjoy life. Yeah. It allows you not to take other people so personally it allows you to give them the space to react and be who they are without judging them too much because you just realize that's their own with inner weather that plays itself out yeah. right that's, that's and i think that's where i i would say you know if you want a story about why self-awareness is useful it because it creates this space in you to be anything yeah. as you want it in the present moment you just got to be conscious of choosing instead of just be driven by exactly. habits it yeah. gives you that space and that place yes. to yeah. make a, cho a conscious choice indeed what you're going to do instead of yeah. just being on autopilot right what would be the right my grandmother used to say you know don't do what's right do what works yeah right? like what would be the skillful way to deal with a situation uh, rather than what seems justified to your emotions or to your brain or to your story or to, you know, like whatever conceptually you have. Because right. that, that's uh, saying do what's right, but what's the definition of right in every situation? Right is a different thing. Mm, yeah. So you're right. You need to actually think about what's going to be effective. And, and it, that's a very interesting point, you know, Darren, because then you, you have to ask, if you think about that, you have to ask, is there, is there some sort of a right that is non-negotiable? Mm. Right, like is, is everything is relative, right? Is there any truth that is, that is, that is not negotiable? And, and could, you know, take being a soldier, for example, murdering is wrong, yeah. but we are told that murdering people under the circumstances of saving your country or protecting your yeah. community or whatever is right. Yeah. Is that so, right? You want to ask those questions. You want to be very careful when you say, well, everything is relative because the suggestion is, if we explore it deeply, is that what is right is what is natural to our way of being when it's not screwed up. Right. Another example. And this is another research that I, I happen to be interested, so that's why I'm, I'm quoting some research from Israel. But, but they've taken kids from the conflict, you know, so they've taken Palestinian kids and Israeli kids, yep. and they wire them to MRI, and then they show them pictures of... Uh, of what's going on for people when they're in strife from the conflict. So I, I think, you know, I would imagine it will be, you know, people getting bombed in Gaza Strip and people getting bombed in thousand cities in Israel or whatever. I don't know the actual photos, but people in strife, people suffering because of the conflict. Gotcha. And, and what they've seen in their brain is fascinating, is, is that the first thing that lights up in your brain when you see another human being in, in strife is the center of compassion. You know, we wired to feel compassionate when we see someone else's suffering. Yep. What kicks in later is the understanding or the story or the insight of these are my people or this is the other side. Right, gotcha. And when it's the other side, it switches off the center of compassion. Yeah, so in other, in words, other words, the natural, the natural response was the right one or the most... Yes. The, the most effective one and the most humane one before we That's started we, we wired to this you know we go back to happiness we wired to feel content and happiness as a, this is why michael Nee says we you know babies don't need psychology we wired to be okay yeah. we wired to be open and happy and interested and engage with people and 
you know, like if, if you take racial tensions, right? Like if you took a group of kids and you put them in a room and they have different genders and colors and, and races and religions or whatever, they're not going to run any of those tricks on each other until they've learned to do it. You know, it's exactly. a learned behavior to hate someone for the color of the skin. Yep, exactly. Because otherwise it's just like, you know, it's the kaleidoscope of life. Like yeah. you don't, you know, like you don't hate this tree because it looks different to that tree. It's right? totally it's irrational, and illogical. Yeah. So, so I, we, we naturally wired for certain things. And I think when we look about right and wrong, like is there an ultimate right or wrong? That's a good clue for us. The, the, the fascinating um, point about that particular research is that guess how long it takes for that to switch off? Uh, that mechanism that switches off the story? Uh, many seconds. Yeah, half a second. Wow. So it's not even a conscious thing, right? It's like we leave from the story of, oh, you know, that's what I said. He's a conservative. Straight away, I don't like him because, or her because, you know, they're like, that's... I, I don't know anything about that person, but I'm projecting my interpretation of how life should work and happen and what people should do with their economics and their liberties or whatnot on that person just because they gave you know somehow i, I know that that's the tag that they give themselves yeah. i know nothing about them but i'm judging them from my own story and we do that all the time all the time all the time incredible yeah. and so if we take everything we've just discussed and we apply it to this la this period that we're in right now with covid you know it's been a tough time for a lot of people <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What can we learn? What, what opportunities are there for growth? What, what lessons should we take away from mm, Yeah. Amazing times, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an unprecedented time. Unprecedented. Um, even when you look at world wars, like the two that happened, which were terrible. And in terms of, you know, the impact on lives, they were, you know, we're not even anywhere near. Yeah. Possibly because we're doing stuff about it, right? Yeah. But, but in terms of the impact overall, the planet, bigger than that, you know, like, like never been so many countries involved and so many, you know, so many economies sort of falling apart and all that. Um, so what I found fascinating in this situation is that in a sense, what we're seeing is we're seeing the illusion of life as we thought, right, they ha it happens, yeah. dissipates or disappear or, or fall apart, right? And what we see is the reality or, or the, 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 the real condition of things, the way they play out, uh, rather than the projected conditions that we have in our minds about it. So I'll give you three examples. Sure. The first is that, and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation, right? If there was anything that proves to us that we're not in control, here comes this situation and says, well, so you had plans to go to Europe. Yep. <laughs> tough oh you were planning to get a salary next week yeah right yeah ah you said you'll be able to go to the super and buy toilet paper right <laughs> that's right well guess what you can't in other words the factors that are coming in from external uh, you know external situations and suddenly dictate the story of your life yep. suddenly become very large and your ability to dictate the story of your life becomes very small right very true. and the only reason why we had it there in the first place is because we lived in a developed democracy that more or less works yep. you know if you live in half of the places on the planet don't expect water to be in the taps by default we just happen to do it because we got really good water systems right yeah. in other words our, our illusion that we're in control of our life is kind of sustained through this the fact that we have you know relatively good systems that seems to work most of the time and therefore we can assume that they will yeah. and this is just came and says no actually that's not the case and it can change like that and the whole world you know one pangolin or one bat in a in a wet market in china and three months later the whole world is in a shutdown right? right so i think it took that illusion off and 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 good for us we need to kind of contend with it because it goes back to um, what we said in the conversation well if i'm not in charge or if i'm not in control of the circumstances what can i control i can control my focus I can control my meaning i can be present with it etc the second thing is that i think we can live under the illusion that we're not interconnected Right. And, and this is, you know, not so much uh, how to say uh, this is kind of my opinion. So I'll share that as my opinion. But I think that partly uh, why we lost the ability to see our interconnected is because we subjugated the feminine wisdom in our leadership and in our tribes and in our communities for so long that we lost that capacity, which does come 
right. through the feminine. You know, the ability of understanding how everything works together, right? We don't, we don't do that very well. And it, interestingly enough, there is some research now that suggests that the countries has done the worst in terms of dealing with, with the crisis are the countries that had very, you know, alpha male, me, 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 kind of like, yeah. I know what I need to do. Yep. Um, I don't care about what other people think. Very you selfish. Know, make the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Those countries have done the worst. And the countries that seems to have done the best, by and large, it's a generalization, are the countries that had feminine leadership um, in action because they kind of see the interconnectedness and they, they talk with everyone and they get everyone to work together and all that sort like of that. stuff. So, so I think understanding how we are interconnectedness, because you and I have, have, have suffered because of that bat in a wet market in, in Wuhan, um, is, a, is a wake up call for us. And even more so, I'll, I'll take it one step further. If you strip away the narrative of what's going on on an individual level and you look at it as a, on a sort of like tribal communal level, you and I are wrecking our lives to help someone who we don't know stay alive. Wow. Yep. You don't get more interconnectedness than that. It's, like it's right that against way. every yep. ego-based nature that humans have developed it's in centric. protecting self, protecting family, protecting tribe. Protect, you know, like yep. We literally have gone to the extent of wrecking our own lives yep. um, because what it seems to do is it seems to keep safe everyone and therefore some 80-year-old in some, you know, some Shepperton aged care or somewhere else yeah. they're going to have a better chance at living because you and I have no job, that sort of stuff, wow. right? So I think that's an amazing sort of invitation. Absolutely. Um, and the third one, and that's where I have hope, you know, in terms of all this kerfuffle and all this tremendous suffering that people have gone to, through in terms, of, in terms of what's going on, is that I think there is an understanding um, that normal is broken, uh, but because we are, it's like, you know, it's a little bit like we're already on the vehicle and it's already driving at 160 kilometers an hour. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and some of us are saying, well, we're not going in a good direction and the engine is heating up. Yep. While others say, well, we're already in speed and we, you know, like this must be working because we're speeding up so well. And, we, no, no. and, and this suddenly sort of put a break on the, on the speed and just stop it and, and kind of say as well, actually, maybe it's not doing the right thing. And suddenly we have a chance to rethink and calibrate, rethink the way that we uh, engage with our families, our relatives, rethink with the way that we engage with work, rethink with the way that we, um, you know, we, we spend our downtime, all that sort of stuff. So I think, I think there is a blessing in that because what I'm hoping is that there's not going to be going back to normal because old normal just wasn't working anyway. We need to kind of find a new normal and that normal needs to be interconnected and needs to be less obsessed about being controlled, needs to be less obsessed about the indefinite, you know, sort of economical growth and more about people and how do we care for each other and that sort of stuff. And I think, I think we actually have quite a good opportunity here to kind of reset. Yep. And a lot of people, I think, want that. Like a lot of people suddenly realize they don't want to work 60 hours a week and spend 10 hours a week in transport. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Amazing let's how see nature has kind of found its way to teach us another lesson again yeah that's right fascinating and and you know what just that's a great point because i don't know if you notice it but the the number of videos of of wildlife starting to come back and you know like just so fast within like a week or two weeks or three weeks you know you see sort of wild bears roaming the streets in some places and deer (laughs) and kangaroos and all that and i feel that there's something quite humbling in that you know like we're not that important yeah the planet will be fine. You exactly, know? It's yeah. us that we need to kind of worry about. So, exactly. right. So, so this kind of reminder that, you know, life goes on and if humans sort of get sidelines and into cage, like we literally been put in cages. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the planet is just happy to kind of keep doing its thing and, and write itself back into this sort of like natural harmony with you know, harmony with, you know, wildlife and, yep. and clean air and clean water and stuff like that. There is something humbling in that, that we should take notice of. I think. Definitely. I, I love that. That is so true. That is so true. Wow. I mean, we've covered amazing stuff. I mean, really been a fascinating conversation, but Indeed. before I let you go, I just want to maybe give you the opportunity to tell everybody a bit about how you work with, um, people and how they can find you if they want to find you. Sure. I, I'd love that. So I work as a coach and a trainer. Um, and so that means that I usually find myself 
doing this kind of work or this kind of conversations, but within more specific practical envelopes or containers, right? So I work with individual teams who realize that may, they might be successful, but there is an emptiness there, right? In other words, the success that they've defined to themselves as, oh, this must be making me happy, yep. seem to deliver it. Yeah. Uh, and even more specifically, teams who realize that they might be able to deliver the job they do, but surely there is a better to do it than getting annoyed all the time about the person who doesn't do this or doesn't do that. Okay. So I bring a mixture of uh, uh, you know, processes and learning around EQ, how to develop better EQ, become more resourceful, and what I call mind fitness, which is a kind of a nice way to say mindfulness-based approach or exploration to leadership to team building and to living a better life a, a happier life so to speak and i work uh, either one-on-one -on -one, uh, or i engage with teams as such and like everyone else i'm now gearing to sort of do more work online so i'm writing a couple of courses that are going to be online in the in the coming months but if you have any interest uh to explore anything uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me and um, and have a chat. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm very lucky. I feel I'm very, very lucky because I get to talk to people about what's meaningful for them. Yep. And, and and if, if you know, as a parting note, if you notice one of the things that really is, makes life worth living is those places and, and situations where we get to a point where we feel vulnerable and authentic with another human being. You know, that's the stuff that really is, worthwhile kind that's where the marrow of life is right mm -hmm. and so i get to work with people who wants to go there so if you want to do that uh reach out to me uh through my website it's called happyhabits.com.au uh one word happy habits uh and just send me a note through the website or if you want to email me you can email me through michael um and the address is slightly complicated but it's called positive neuroplasticity Wow. <laughs> Which is a very complex way to say happy habits. <laughs> um, right. So Michael at positive neuroplasticity.com.au um, uh, email me or just, yeah, just send a message through the website. That's easy. And uh, you'll email. find that email on the website. Uh, well, uh, I think, I've just revamped it, so I can't remember. But you can send, there's a, there's a contact form. You know, the easiest thing, connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you, if you look for mindfulness coaching, that's the, that's the tag that I have on my LinkedIn. Or just look for Michael Bartura and, um, and connect with me on LinkedIn and let's continue the conversation. Um, I'm always, uh, I always feel it's a delight to talk to anyone. So don't hesitate to ping me out and let's have a chat. Fantastic. And I'll make sure I put all those links uh, and details in the notes so people can Appreciate access yeah. Michael as quickly as they can. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. It's been an absolute enlightening discussion. Thank you I've learned so much. And I'm going to be, have to revisit this conversation many times to really grasp everything that, you know, we discussed because it was so powerful and so, um, and quite analytical at times, which is great. So I hope everybody's really got a lot out of this conversation. And the fact that we, you know, one thing that's come out of this for me is just that we have to take a second to separate ourselves from in any situation to kind of remove that, um, perception of who we are from what mm. is really going to be an effective choice for that particular yeah, moment. Absolutely. That's, that's a really, really nice little, uh, that's a good summary. I'll, I'll, I'll just mention this. So St. Francis of Assisi says, what you're looking for is what looking is. Oh, I like that. Right. <laughs> in other words, if you can just remember in any situation, however troublesome, to be present with looking at that situation. Love it. You're already in that space where you're not, you know, like we just tend to kind of lose ourselves in what's going on. We like, we, we there, we inside, we kind of like in the mud fighting with it. Right. Gotcha. But if we just take a space, say, Oh my God, like I'm just watching this situation. If it, you know, if it, if it wasn't me, it was just a situation and suddenly there is a space and the easiest way to do that is to just remember to take a deep breath because you cannot, not be present if you are consciously taking a deep breath and if you breathe into your stomach at the same time you start to switch on the parasympathetic nerve system so so just this taking a deep breath into your stomach in any situation where you start to feel troubled will already take you halfway through it so Beautiful. What, a, what a lovely way to finish i think yes and michael thank you again it's been an enlightening discussion thank you for inviting me it's a pleasure thank my you. pleasure and for everybody out there i hope you got a lot out of that 
and we'll see you very, very soon for another episode. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.